I've fought friends on a number of occasions. You do have to block that out of your mind. And Lester, you know, we had him up on the on the wall with the enemy written on him, and he was the enemy. And by the time I got in the ring, he really was the enemy. I didn't really overreact, but what I said and what I did was what I meant at the time. I was 20 year old, I hated the world, and I hated him. Contest between Lester Ellis, the champion, Barry Michael, the challenger. You're going to fight another man to win, to beat him, to stay where you are, to stay champion, and to take his championship away from him. Last opportunity to uh, win uh, a major title at 30 years of age. If he doesn't win this one tonight, uh, it could be the end of the road for Barry Michael. I'd not experienced anything like it, and I don't suppose I have since in, in my life as a, an observer of sport. It was, a, it was a tasty fight. Barry was with the boys down at the docks. We were with the, the Italian boys in, uh, on Ligon Street. It's obvious that uh, the majority of the crowd here at Festival Hall is on the side of the champion. This will go down as one of the greatest fights in Australia. Two Melbourne boys. On the night of July 12th, 1985, at Melbourne Festival Hall, one of Australia's greatest boxing matches took place between Lester Ellis and Barry Michael. It was more than a fight for a world championship. It was a settling of a personal feud between friends who'd fallen out. Friends who'd helped each other through the toughest sport of all, the fight game. Such a falling out could only have a bloody resolution and profound consequences that neither could have imagined. When years earlier, Lester Ellis was a hungry kid from Sunshine and Barry Michael was his hero. And we're all ready now for round one of this world Junior lightweight championship between the champion Lester Ellis coming out of the right corner and the challenger Barry Michael. When Lester Ellis was 12, he met Barry Michael. Barry was 22, a world rated lightweight, and like Lester, an English migrant and working class boy from Melbourne's West. From the start, Barry befriended and encouraged young Lester. I used to travel around a lot of the gyms and spar all the young amateurs or basically anyone and I went to the Glen Gala gym and and probably sparred I don't know, half a dozen of their boys and Lester was one of them and uh, he, uh, you know he got in the ring with me and he was 12 years of age and he had, and I was 22 and he um, attacked me with you know fearless abandon basically and I got out the ring and I said who is this kid and they said Lester Ellis and I said this kid's going to be a world champion. Lester, whose family came to Australia from Blackpool, England, was brought up in difficult circumstances. The anger that took him to a world boxing title was kindled when he was seven years of age. It was then that his mother left Lester's father and her three sons. Oh, mum's my mum, I mean, she brought me into the world, but uh, when she left me being so young, I was very, very depressed, wagging school, very confused. I actually hated women until I was about probably 16 years old. And when you turn 16, 17, get a girlfriend, then I started to calm down. It had a profound effect upon us because I think all three of us basically have a, or did have, a, um, a, mistrust, a mistrust of women. We're always thinking that you can't give too much love or too much uh, towards them because one day they're just going to pack their bags and they're going to go. Bewildered, angry, Lester wags school most days. One of those days he scraped together enough money to see a movie, Rocky. It changed his life. When I was a little boy, six years old, I never had no anger. I loved my mum, I loved my dad, I loved my brothers. I didn't want to be a fighter. No, I know. And I was a soft, calm kid. But then when she left, when I got to 12 and I seen that movie, a demon came out of me. said, that's it, I'm doing that. And I said to Keith, I'm going to be a bull champion soon. And he came home four weeks later and said that he was having a fight, which was, we were all terrified. So we went on to the South Side Six and he pulled a kid from Tasmania and he jumped in and he just jabbed and jabbed and he threw about 8,000 jabs and he won the fight pretty easy, but he took to it like a, like a duck to water. So that was the start of uh, his career, like he won one, lost one, won one, lost one. He was sort of the kid who was first to come to the gym, last to go home. He was really, really dedicated, but he had no weight on him at all and he had really, really skinny arms. He just had a jab and run around, so he, he would jab and run, jab and run, jab and run. He, he just improved out of sight, and he had uh, a fair few amateur fights, and, he, and he, he won the amateur fights just basically by jabbing and running.
He just got stronger and faster and more skilled and powerful. And Barry had a bit to do with that because he used to come around and spar him as a little boy. The first time I ever boxed Barry, I was 12 years of age. I was a Victorian flyweight champion. Barry Michaels was a current Australian lightweight champion. He would have been about 24 years of age when I first uh, met Barry. And um, he was an idol for me. I looked up to Barry. I'd never dreamed in a million years that he'd be fighting me. It's very ironic that he'll be fighting me eight years later for my world titles. Barry Michael himself had been trudging a hard road. He'd been a tough fighter, never off his feet. And since his promising start as TV ringside's best first year fighter in 1973, he traveled that road often by himself. Now, boxing survived on Barry for a while. When boxing was, was the down in Melbourne, Barry Boy Michael almost single-handedly kept it alive. Uh, he kept spruiking for boxing, kept interest in boxing up. When I got to main event status, boxing was basically dead and I had to say a lot of things. I had to self-promote myself and so consequently I said things to get people to come and watch me and instead of getting a following, it turned a lot of people against me. Opportunities in Australia were drying up and Barry sought fights in Southeast Asia and Europe. He lost a few and the career-making fight he craved with the big money he knew would accompany it seemed a world away. Still, Barry was determined to keep fighting until he was appreciated. Barry never got the rewards that were due him. Um, you're supposed to be rewarded uh, by your effort and by your skill and by your determination. Uh, Barry had all that, he just didn't get the rewards for having it. By the start of the 1980s, Barry was, to many minds, past it. A mere journeyman, a professional opponent. Then something remarkable happened began to defeat world raiders and prospects for whom he was meant to be just a stepping stone. Graham Brook, Frank Ropus, Juan Arroyo, and the formidable American Al Earthquake Carter, a rising star who only ever won his fights one way, by brutal knockout. Before the fight, um, everybody was, I could tell with the nervousness, everyone was nervous about, you know, the, the ability the bloke had and uh, some of the TV guys had actually filmed him and they didn't want to give me the footy because he was that awesome in the gym. Um, I was very pumped. Barry gave me two tickets because I boxed him uh, two or three times a week for a month uh, the lead up to that fight. So I got on the train and I arrived there a couple of hours early. I wanted to sit right at the front, right next to Barry's corner. The bell rang, Earthquake came out and hit Barry with a right hand shot. Barry turned white. I thought, oh my God, he's killed him. Both Barry came out of it and, of course, um, won the fight. I was a 13-year-old boy in the crowd watching Barry Michaels fight this bloke that could fight. He could punch, he could jab, he could box, he could even fight. This bloke was a time bomb. He hair lifted. I said, that's unbelievable. I mean, I think he was a bit faster than Barry and punched a bit harder than Barry. Barry's determination and his body punches just overwhelmed him and just run him down into the ground. And he's on his way to victory in the tenth and final round. When I beat Carter, um, you know, we thought we really thought it was going to give us an opportunity to fight for a world title, but instead it uh, acted the opposite because I got told years later that beating Carter actually stopped, you know, any chance of me getting a, an opportunity to fight Ray Boom Boom Mancini, the world champion, because. They didn't fancy fighting Carter, and when I beat him, that, that basically, you know, stopped me getting an opportunity. Sometimes you're too good, and being too good, other guys don't want to take the chance. And his management said, he's too good for us. We'll leave him go, let him wear himself out a little bit, and that's what happened. So being too good doesn't help a fighter get ahead in this career. The win over Carter jolted everything sideways for Barry and Lester. Though neither boxer knew it at the time, their careers were now destined for an explosive collision. A victory for one of them would mean devastating defeat for the other. Two years after the Carter fight in 1983, Lester Ellis was a professional boxer and he met with immediate success. Whereas Barry had fought long and hard for a little glory, Lester was about to do it in reverse. No amateurs that would fight him and uh, 
The amateurs were a waste of time. We like, won three or four Australian titles and never got any trips or any games or anything like that. So the natural progression was to turn professional. I said to my brother, Keith, I said, you can't eat trophies. I'm not waiting another year on a maybe. So that was my amateur career. So then I just um, waited that 12 months, kept fighting amateur, of course, turned pro at the age of 18. And by the time we got to uh, 85, he had uh, 14 fights for 14 wins. He didn't win an Australian title because no one had fought him for the Australian title. We went straight from a virtually nothing to a Commonwealth title and then to a world title. So by the mid-85, he'd had uh, 14 fights, 14 wins, and he'd beat six or seven national champions from other countries. And uh, he was on fire. He was the blaster. Uh, Lester would hit him and he would hurt him. And as a result, they found it difficult uh, getting suitable matches for him because the money wasn't there to pay fighters to take the kind of damage that Lester was going to do to them. He trained obsessively, harnessing his anger, letting it fuel his violence in the ring. He was dangerous even in sparring practice, seeing it as a chance to practice domination rather than learn from other boxers. In the gym, Lester was deadly on sparring partners. It was, it was always flat out. I mean, I got used to seeing Lester knock so many guys out in the gym, and I used to tell him to try and look after his sparring partners because you need them. He used to run it three or four o'clock in the morning because he thought it gave him a psychological advantage that the other bloke was in bed and he was out running. To get the best out of yourself, you have to sacrifice the things that you love, like going out, food, friends, whatever. I just lived like a hobo at home in my bungalow. Hate the world, Keith, get me another opponent. After the fight, I didn't want to um, you know, celebrate and have two weeks off. I'm fit now, I'm on a roll, get me someone else. At the very start of a long career in the hardest game of all, Lester Ellis won himself a chance at a world title. To secure the fight, he needed backing, and Melbourne entrepreneur Cos Sita threw his weight behind Lester's challenge. It's one thing being offered a world title, but you need the financial support and backing of an entrepreneur, a, uh, a person that's got money or a company, and Cos Sita with Superstar Promotions did that. If you take Cos Sita out of the equation, I don't really know if Lester would have had so many fights and gone so far. Other less reputable figures also became involved. At the heart of Melbourne's underworld crime wars in the 1980s was Alphonse Gazzitano, the self-appointed Prince of Ligon Street and a figurehead for the Carlton crew. Alphonse Gazzitano became one of the uh, partners and uh, we never looked back. We didn't have any trouble with him. Renowned for his generosity to fighters and his influence on ringside gambling, he too decided to back Leicester's tilt at the world title. All the Ligon Street boys like, were behind us, and Alphonse, I thought he was terrific. He made sure we got paid every time. He made sure everything was all right. It was just like having another older brother. Lester's world title opportunity came up against the IBF junior lightweight champion, Juan Kilu, a shaven-headed pit bull with just one loss from 29 fights. It was a brawl, but Lester surprised the Korean with his agility, his explosive power, and his hate-fueled determination to win. One, four, three, can you? One, four, six, Ellis! That's it. Three points of difference. And that must have been a tremendous feeling right there. It says it all. The picture says it all. At the age of 19, this unknown kid from Sunshine in Melbourne's West, with no other prospects in life, was at the summit of his sport. Our um, model changed. Very quickly, I came home and there was eight to 10,000 people in the street and my street was about two kilometres long. It took me two hours to get from the shops, tell them to arrive to Barnes Squares in, in the car. People everywhere. And I uh, didn't believe it. Everyone was giving me money. You want a car? You want this? You want that? Um, shops and restaurants all for free all the time. Our neighbours next door even wrote World Champion Lester on the road outside the front. And it took a couple of days to sink in, but everywhere Lester went, he was recognised, and uh, it was just a, a fabulous time. And we used to, you know, go out and whatever, and we couldn't wait to sort of mention Lester's name because we, we weren't name dropping, but we were so proud of him. 
and coming from migrants and coming from a commission house and coming from the flats, it was like a status symbol. Even today, I have great memories of Leicester and him winning the world title and how famous he, he, he became and how much recognition and how much people really, really loved him. A kid who was playing with these pigeons in the backyard is now suddenly being invited to Parliament House. It was just a marvellous time. This means more to me than money, it means more to me than everything. It's just something I've always dreamed about and I see all belts on other world champions and it's just like a nightmare. I just still can't believe that it's mine. After winning the world title, he just became the glamour boy and the pin-up boy. And I, look, that was understandable because uh, he was a, a breath of fresh air and it was good to see. I mean that, Lessie, you're, you're a very popular champion. Um, what a great fight you had, eh? Oh, it was hard. Isn't it? Hard. <laughs> he ripped in you in the first couple of rounds? After the first couple of rounds, I said I should have started on What's a Bugs Bunny show. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> the way you strut, the way you walk, the way you dress, the way people kind of kiss you behind. They make you really somebody. And all of a sudden, you start to feel it. I mean, you watch a guy in the ring that wins a fight, how all the backslappers are there trying to, to get in the picture with him, raise his arm up as a winner. Watch that same fighter when he loses a fight. Those guys aren't there anymore. So when your guy wins a world championship, I'm talking about the championship of the world, multiply that, and you get all the glad handers in the world. All of a sudden, you get 200 more friends, and yeah, you gotta buy six jars of coffee a week because you get a lot more visitors. And, you know, we have to change the phone number six or seven times. We just weren't prepared for all the attention. And neither was he, and he got a little bit uh, contemptuous, like as you would. I mean, it, it, it just, uh, just, you just get, you just get dagged too much for the want of a better word. You know, you just get, you just suck holes everywhere, and they just, and they do, they come from everywhere. Lester! 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 He was a star. Working class heroics can be double-edged. Love and admiration are often conditional. Suddenly, Lester Ellis, a nobody from nowhere, was enfranchised. His life would never be the same. Actually, it was mind-blowing. You can teach someone how to play football, how to play cricket, but how do you teach a young man at 19 years of age how to handle success? Mind-blowing. One minute I've got 50 bucks in my pocket, next minute I've got 200,000. I'll have this car, I'll have that farm. I was just gone. Every young Sheila was giving him, giving him their phone number. Every old Sheila wanted to mother him. He was invited to social functions three or four times a day. Often I'd be waiting in the gym and he didn't get there because he had to see someone in hospital or uh, had to attend some crappy proposed uh, sponsorship, of which of course nine times out of ten never come off. I received a phone call from uh, Ann Musket, and she said to me, my little boy would like to meet you. He's got cancer and he's dying. And I virtually said no at the start because I've got, I've got a weak heart. And what can I say to a dying kid who's only six or seven years old? What can I say to him? And uh, I hanged up, she rang me back. Who do you think you are? My son wants to meet you right now. You come here right now. Doctors had told Lester that Wayne would die in a matter of days. Nevertheless, Lester offered Wayne a seat at his world title defence against Rod Sequinan three weeks later. Wayne hung on to see Lester retain his title over a brutal 15 rounds. And my little mate, Wayne Musket, from St Albans, he's got cancer, he's very ill. He gave me all the inspiration in the world because he's very sick and he's not too well at all and he still puts a smile on his face. I just had this feeling to go to see Wayne Musket. You know, I jumped in the car, I went there by myself. And he was laying on, on the couch there, his mother, his father Bill and his uh, sister Fiona. He said, Lester, I love you, mate. I love you, mate. I love you. Thanks for taking me to the fight. Anyway, he called his mother and father over, gave them both a kiss on the cheek and his sister, shook me by the hand and said to me, um, the angels in heaven are calling me. I'm very tired, Lester. I'm very tired. And laid down and died. I'm blue. That's exactly what it was. Laid down and died. With a smile on his face. Happy. Lester was profoundly shaken by what he'd witnessed at Wayne's house. He returned home, only to be greeted by the news that his old friend, Barry Michael, had announced his intentions to come down in weight and challenge Lester for his world title. For a second, he was devastated by the news. Then, 
he became angry. I just finished fighting White's Aquinnon, 13 rounds of hell. I mean, I was in a bad way. The next day, this happened to Wayne. I was confused there. Then I looked in the paper and Barry, Barry Mike was challenging me in the Sun Hill. I mean, it's, it's just hit me all in one day, these things. So I was all frustrated, a bit confused, very sad. Keep said, what do you want to do less? I said, book him in, which he did. He said, I'm getting you good money. I said, don't worry the money. I'm going to beat him and then I'm going to go to America and I'm going to beat the rest. When I challenged Lester, um, I didn't know whether he'd accept. Uh, I think at, at first they thought I was kidding because uh, I hadn't made the weight in 10 years and really, I think in my camp, I was the only person that thought I could do it. Uh, my trainer didn't think I could do it. My father didn't think I could do it. But uh, when, I, when I saw Lester, Lester win the world title, I, I just knew that was the only way I could get a shot. I thought if I can beat Barry, I'm not just a world champion, I'm the best pound for pound Australia's got. His bed was like the old fossil, always there, always come back, always got up and beat someone good. And I seen him beat um, Earthquake Carter, world rank fighter, so he was the one, in my mind, if I beat him, I'm 100% the world champion. But my my trainer, Keith, and my dad, what do you want him for? Your world champion is nothing, so you got nothing to prove. Barry had waited for 12 years for the chance at a world title and threw himself into training. But few believed he could lose the weight required to fight in Leicester's division and still stay strong enough to last 15 rounds against the young champion. Had my fat content weighed underwater at uh, RMIT in Footscray and they found that if I got down to a, a body fat content, I think it was about 6%, I think it's equivalent to a marathon runner, that I could make the weight and be quite comfortable. I would have walked through a brick wall to get a shot at a world title. To make 58.9 was a nightmare, it was hard, I hadn't done it in 10 years. And 1,000 calories a day when you're training tw hard twice a day, six, seven days a week, is, is you're basically starving yourself. Dana, Keith, kept telling me, you've got a lot of weight to lose. Late in the fight, you're going to hurt this guy. You're going to hurt him bad. If they expect me to fade after six or seven or eight rounds, I've got another thing coming. I think it'll be a war, but I think uh, I'll stand the wear and tear better. I think my body shots and hooks will wear him down, and I think I'll stop him round about the 10. Lester's camp, fronted by the American Dana Goodson, were confident that Barry couldn't make the weight. Goodson was in a position to know. He had been Barry's friend and trainer before defecting to the Ellis camp. I'm filthy on Dana Goodson, who I brought out here and promoted, and who is the most despicable human being that I've met. Uh, Keith Ellis has done some disgusting things, and even, even Lester, who I used to have a lot of time for, has said some terrible things. I've done nothing but ever help that kid. I trained him and taught him when he was 12 years old, right the way through. Barry, we give him a, his dream, a title fight that he never had. He's never got a chance. We give him that fight. He should be happy and shut up. He's opened his mouth a bit too much. So uh, we intend to shut it and shut it good. To me, it was not only a physical battle, it was a mental battle. And boxing is a mental battle, a psychological battle. And I was always good at winning the psychological battle. I knew he had a picture in his gym in the city. I think he had one on the wall, the enemy, one on his bag, but I also had one on my dartboard. Barry Mock was smiling away on throwing darts at it every day, every day. I, I, out of all my fights, he would have been one of the blokes that I wanted to beat desperately. In the build-up to the fight, I really, with the, the, the things that were said, by the time we got in the ring, I was so dirty on him. I, was, was, I, I think I was angrier at him than anyone I'd ever got in the ring with. But yeah, it was sad because we'd been good mates for such a long time. I just don't like person. That's all. I used to spray him when I was a lot younger and I used to help him all the time. And I had three or four big fights coming up, Commonwealth title, two world titles. And he never ever wanted to help me, just it's all for himself. The age, the age of the barrier for Lester Ellis, because he's a boy and I'm a man, that'll be the difference. No, I had in my mind that this Barry Michael, this guy's got no principle. He's no good. This bloke's no good. Why would you be dirty on a kid that's trained with you for years in the gym, get up and win a world title? I was the first, first world champion for many years. I would have been wrapped for my you know, younger sparring partner to do something like that. So I, I wasn't happy. I, did, um, I, didn't over, I didn't really overreact, but what I said and what I did was what I meant at the time. I was 20 year old, I hated the world, and I hated him. As the friendship deteriorated, Melbourne's underworld was divided as the outcome of the fight. The Carlton crew were backing Leicester, with their rivals, the Dockers, supporting Barry. With a lot of money on the line, Alphonse Scantitano made an unexpected phone call to Barry a month before the fight. And I said, Al, I know that you're backing Leicester. I said, today I had a trial, Wayne made the weight, 
and sparred 15 rounds with four different opponents, which was really hard, and did 15 hard rounds. And I said, he can't beat me. And I said, and he said, I'm not having a bet. I love you both. And I'm not having a bet on the final. I said, Al, I know you're back in Leicester. And uh, he didn't listen. By the time of the weigh-in, both fighters looked to be in perfect condition. Leicester looked sharp. Barry, lighter than he'd been for a decade, was expected to be gaunt, but he appeared surprisingly strong. People thought it'd be very hard for Barry Boy Michael to get down to junior lightweight, even though it was only four pounds. Whereas Lester fought at that weight, he was strong at that weight. And they thought on that basis alone, Lester had the wood on Barry. But uh, Barry always had something up his sleeve. And uh, that something up his sleeve was the determination and the courage and the guts and the ability to push himself beyond the limits. from Melbourne and welcome to this piece of Australian sporting history. For the first time ever, two Australian boxers fighting for a recognised world title. Well, with me, two commentators from Sydney, the ABC specialist boxing commentator, John O'Reilly, and at the far end, a huge welcome to a huge man. Twice went the distance with Muhammad Ali, once with Joe Frazier. I don't really need to introduce Joe Bugner. The crowd was nervous. There was a, an energy in the crowd. Imagine a, a warm, humid day outside and you know lightning's going to strike. You know it. And you just don't want to be there when it strikes. Keeps to be bug when I go out there, make him wait. So I was pointing at the bit, I said, let's go. It was a hot night and I was cursing, let's go, Keith. Let's get this on. He said, no, nah, he can wait 15, 20 minutes, bugger him. And the um, TV crew came in, you've got to come out. We're going to time, we're losing time. I wasn't sure what was happening. He said, go on, go on the chair, put your feet up and relax. We're going out there in 15, 20 minutes. Make him wait. Who does he think he is? And that's exactly what we've done. We made him wait. And uh, I come out after, I don't know if it was 15 or 16 minutes, but it was a long time. I just knew he had to come out. I was happy, I was, I was in the ring, ready to fight for the world title. Wouldn't have matter if Lester had to take an hour because I, I knew he had to come out. Everyone was there waiting to see the fight and I was happy to be there, believe me. By the time Lester was ready, he was craving the fight. From the moment he emerged into the light of Festival Hall, he was seeking out Barry in the ring. As soon as I got in the ring, I was very angry straight away. I looked at him and I walked straight over to him. I told him what I thought of him. He told me what he thought of me. The thing he said to me, oh, thanks for the title, Lester. I said, really? Seems for seen a couple of minutes. What do you say about that? I think there seemed to be a slight animosity between the two men. The crowd was, uh, <laughs> was fantastic. Um, they were there, a lot of them, to see Lester win. Barry had taught Lester how to use his mouth to psych out opponents and was curious to hear what Lester would say. As Lester was growing up and I'd run with him and I'd spar with him and I'd train with him and he got into my head and I got into his head and I, I told him, taught him how to psych opponents out and he used to sit ringside and watch me fight guys and tell them what I was doing to them as I'd be ripping them in the body and whatever. And uh, the night we got in the ring, uh, I knew Lester was going to try it on me, but I knew, I knew it wasn't going to work. I said, Barry, I'm, I'm going to give it to you tonight. I'm going to embarrass you, I'm going to bash you, I'm going to hurt you bad. He said, look, man, I've been kicking your ass since you were 12 years old. Can you kick, tell your mother to um, get her shoes out of me panel van? Like, he said, fire up, and I fired up bad. I said, listen, I said, mate, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to, this fight has happened. I'm going to hurt you bad. He said, no way. I'll beat you all your life, and I'll beat you tonight again. And I said to him at one stage, Lester, I've taught you everything you know, but not everything I know. <laughs> And we're all ready now for round one of this World Junior Lightweight Championship between the champion Lester Ellis coming out of the red corner and the challenger Barry Michael, two Melbourne boys. Barry Michael's 
scores with a left to the side of the head. First I went to the ring that night to uh, inflict uh, pain and, and punishment on Barry. I think he was hurt, he was emotionally hurt about the previous treatment over the, the last couple of years and things like that. And he was locked in, he was locked in for battle. And he thought he was going to knock him out. And Dana thought he was going to knock him out as well. And I was hoping he was going to knock him out. He's got Michael in the corner, but Michael comes back with a left grip to the body. Good punch. Lester wanted Barry very badly. He wanted to beat Barry up. Everything that Barry had said had gotten under Lester's skin, and Lester was going to make Barry pay for it. When we first started exchanging punches, Lester threw a left hook to my body, which was, uh, you know, probably one of his best punches and the punch that I'd taught him. It hit my right elbow and it skidded off my elbow and hit me in the lower in the body, and I felt something tear in the lower part of my body. And after the fight, it was just fleeting pain for a split second, and you know, then I got my mind back on the job. But after the fight, I, was, I passed blood, and I figured that that shot was the one that did it, and people don't realise what those body shots do, do to you. I think both men have forgotten about feeling each other out. Uh, yes. I think we're going to have an action-packed fight right the way through. We certainly are. It was vicious from the outset, and neither was willing to concede an inch of canvas. Barry knew the violence of Lester's punches, and he clinched instinctively to keep his combatant close. Lester broke away to land ferocious, jarring blows. But between punches, Barry kept taunting Lester. Good punches to the head, both left and right. Okay, Barry! Well, both very determined. During the course of the fight, he will say things like, is that as hard as you can hit? My mother punches harder than you. And uh, then, then Lester will try to load up, because that can get you on edge too. You get loaded up, you think, he accuses me of not punching as hard as his mother. I'll show him. And that's what Barry tries to get you to do. In the second and third rounds, Barry kept stalking forwards. Years earlier, he'd taught Lester how to body punch, and they dug in hard to each other's midriffs, each trying to better the other's attack. Still, Barry kept his mouth close to Lester's ear. Oh, good left by Ellis. I've never experienced anybody who talks in the ring. Never, never experienced it. So, um, every time I had something on my brain, like tactics or a combination, or I hit him with a good shot and wobbled him, if we come so quickly and come back with words, let's don't take it easy, I'll catch up to you. But uh, the talking did affect me. So in less than these 12 rounds to go ahead, mate, pull up, I'll catch up to you. And it got, got, in, it got into my brain a little bit. Hey. Oh, low blow from Michael. The referee will speak to him and ask him to keep the punches up. I don't think it was a deliberate punch, John. I think it was the moment. You know, yes, I agree with you. Finally, 30 seconds from the round's end, Lester did as he was expected to do. Michael having to cover up. 25 seconds left in the round. And the crowd urging Ellis on. But another good left trip into the body by Michael. In the third round, Lester hit me with, with some bombs. That was when Gus Mercurio had warned me for hitting low, and he picked me up perfectly with the uppercut and crashed me with the right hand on the chin. And my trainer, Ray Styles, had kept saying to me, watch the right hand, watch the right hand. And we'd sparred thousands of rounds. And I was never hurt in the gym by Lester, even though he hit me some good shots. But that right hand he hit me with seriously hurt me. And he knew I was hurt, pushed me against the ropes, bombarded me with both hands. And I tried to grab him. He pushed me off again and bombarded me again. Barry had never been so hurt, not even by Earthquake Carter. The punches lifted him off the floor put me in what they call the half dream room. It's like an explosion in your head and, uh, you know, blackness and, and, and stars and, and you know, pins and needles in my feet. I couldn't feel my legs for a few seconds and, and I knew I was badly hurt. He, he bombed me, pushed me against the ropes. I tried to grab him and I, basically you can't see him. It's all black, but I could feel the pins and needles in my feet, so I knew I was still standing. And finally I got hold of him and I said, Lester, if that's the best you can do, you want to forget it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was tough. He was hit with some beautiful punches there. And a very good third round of this World Championship contest. Having predicted a third round knockout, the Ellis camp didn't realise how close they'd come. But Barry had survived and Lester had left the door slightly open. You know, Lester was just giving him a bath. He was just knocking him from one, um, you know, one post to the other. But uh, it was still, you know, like there was 12 rounds to go. I'm, I'm not happy till 
until it's over. It's no good celebrating until it's done. You haven't won till you've won, and you haven't you haven't lost till the end of the fight either. Ellis fought without guile but ruthlessly. Over the next few rounds, as Ellis's violence reached its full ferocity, the pattern continued. Barry boring in, Lester spinning out and raining down hurtful punches. Barry greeted Lester's blows with a grin, but in close, over Lester's shoulder, he grimaced. On the referee's blind side, Michael used his alley cat instincts, holding, dragging laces, and goading Lester with words. Barry was uh, egging Lester on, Lester bit, Lester wanted to skin Barry alive, and as a result, he loaded up with every punch. But if you throw a punch, it's loaded and you miss it, it takes as much energy out of you as it does if you landed the punch. On more than one occasion, Lester was ahead on points, but Barry had survived six rounds, and his punches were becoming increasingly insistent. I think a lot of people in the boxing business will uh, realize that Barry Michael does mean business and that just because he's 30 years old, he's not over the hill. At the end of rounds, Barry was raising his hands victoriously to tease the crowd, enraging Lester, who had stalked to his corner after reluctantly heeding the bill. You're really beyond exhaustion and you've got a bloke in front of you trying to take your head off and you're not even sure sometimes if you're if you're winning the rounds, I'd come back to the corner and say, what round is it? And you lose track of the rounds as well because you're that uh, focused on physically and mentally on what you're doing in there and it, it, uh, it, it's really tough, it really is hard. Well, it's round six and Barry Michael was very keen to get on with it. Barry Michael had predicted victory in the middle rounds and as soon as they arrived, the realisation that he might come to own the fight began to dawn on the partisan crowd. After I'd got over the third round where he had me badly shaken, um, I was back on track and I was getting stronger and, and uh, you know, it, providing I didn't get caught again like I did in the third, um, I really felt the tide start to turn. But it's amazing what a, an old experienced fighter like Michael can do. He can turn that thing around and pull it his way. Come on. It was during the middle rounds, 7 to 11, that the fighter with the most stomach for the inevitable grind ahead would come to the fore. This was to be one of the last 15 rounders ever fought and the end of a great era in boxing. It had been agreed by authorities that the championship rounds, 13 to 15, were too dangerous. It was during those rounds that the most damage was done to fatigued fighters. I can actually feel the power between those punches. Both these men are really throwing some heavy leather. There was no doubt that in these middle rounds, the Sunshine Kid seemed to shrink slightly. He slowed just a little, conceding that he'd need to preserve some juice if he was to take Barry all the way. Well, if you fought seven and a half or eight rounds at top physical effort, you're going to run down on your juices a bit. But a fit fighter, a fighter that's trained correctly, should be able to go the next eight rounds as hard almost as he did the previous eight rounds. A fit fighter, a thinking fighter that works his way through the fight. At telling moments, Lester would slumber a little, telegraphing punches from a distance. Blood poured from a deep crescent slice under his right eye. And from his corner, Dana Goodson began to shout his frustration. Dana was a bit uh, erratic, um, screaming at me, come on, champ, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, load up. So Dana's out there and Keith's out there, we're both entirely different. Dana wanted me to back him up and knock him out. Keith wanted me to go to work, get the points, win the fight. Sounds the end of round seven and another excellent round. I don't know how these boxes are keeping up this pace. Michael, Michael looking confident at the end of the round. Yes. Just a touch of cockiness about him. That's a nasty dash he's got under his right eye there, Tim. Dana was starting to panic and Lester was starting to panic. And I knew there was nine rounds to go and I knew that the last six would, would be Barry's uh, best rounds. So we had to change our ideas and, you know, it was, uh, we were starting to slip. Tremendous closing shot. But just as he looked like fading, Lester took the eighth round with a hammering right hand. The fight was even again. I wasn't actually thinking about combinations. I was actually thinking about loaded bombs. We wait for them to come in. Perry's um, style was pretty... It's predictable. You know he's going to come up here all the time. You know he's on your chest. I just planted my feet, bent my legs, bum me out, nice and relaxed, loading up loaded shots. Left hook, left uppercut, right hand, 
whatever it was. I have great admiration for Barry Michael to come back at the age of 30 and fight a 20-year-old champion who's as strong as fit as this. It's remarkable. Up until the 10th round, I had no intention of uh, changing my um, style. I keep saying, move around, box, enjoy yourself, now get the points. I wasn't happy with that. I would not have been happy with a points victory. I wanted a clear knockout. So I won clearly. Everyone knew that was the best. But by the time I got to the 10th, I knew I had a bit of a problem there. He's still there and I've hit him with everything. His ears hanging off, his nose is hanging off. But I couldn't drop him. The excitement in this place is just unreal, isn't it? I mean, the crowd is really alive. It certainly is. I really felt the tide start to turn and I kept telling Lester I was beating him and I could feel him psychologically diminishing, even though he still threw bombs and with class and speed. The crowd, sensing their champion was timing, chanted Lester's name. It seemed to spur him. The champion is showing that he is champion and he's coming back with some tremendous punches, one two. I think Barry had slowed him down with the uh, the tactics and just kept him close and just just worked away and it was just round after round, clinch after clinch, kidney punch after kidney punch. Barry was getting more and more injured, but I think he could have walked through three people with baseball bats that night. Now the big question mark over him was whether losing those few kilos might uh, take it out of him if it came to this sort of crunch into the championship rounds, but he looks confident that uh, that's not going to affect him. Then, late in the 12th round, a searing right hand smashed Barry's nose. Suddenly Ellis was back with a chance. And at the end of the 12th round, I came back to the corner and uh, Joe Bugman, the commentator, had picked up that my nose had been busted because the blood was just streaming straight out of my nose, straight down my mouth and ripping off my chin. But at the end of the 12th, I came back and I said, he's broken, he's broken the nose. And my trainer, Ray Styles, said, forget it, forget it, three rounds and you're champion of the world. You're in front, three rounds you're champion of the world. I was looking for sympathy, and sympathy. I said, but he's broken my nose. You know, it had never been busted before in 56 fights. Fight. Very close, that's it. Yes. I think both uh, boxers uh, realise that uh, these three rounds could decide at the last three because there's very little in at, the, uh, at this stage. There's always been a lot said about how the fact that Lester should have boxed me instead of standing toe to toe with me. But in reality, Lester wasn't a boxer, he was a fighter. And that was the way he fought. And it wouldn't have made any difference. I really don't believe to the, the pattern of the fight because I made Lester, with my experience, fight my fight. And that was the end of the story, as far as I'm concerned. 100% I believe in my mind, I've told about this also. He laughed, but I told him. I said, if you would have been someone that I've never known, someone I had no respect for, just from another country, another um, world contender, and those, those times I hurt you and I rocked you, I would have jumped onto you and walked you straight out of there. And right then, the back of my mind, he, he was the champion. I was the boy, because I was to watch him. Oh, one day I'm going to be like him, 20-year-old, 24-year-old. So. Yeah, he, he, we were close mates, and uh, I was a boy, he was a man. That uh, sort of catches uh, Ellis by surprise. Huh? That's his old craftiness coming out. Barry Michael showing all his experience, and uh, it's paying off in many areas. Come on. Ahead on points, Barry did everything he could to frustrate Lester in the 14th, while Lester flailed away, searching for the knockout punch that would end the torment and secure his title. It was very difficult to train Lester for that fight because all he wanted to do was knock Barry's block off. But when we actually got into the ring, I sensed I sensed something different. I, I think he just looked up to him as an older brother and what are we doing here? It, no, even though he went on and, and did the job, I just I just sensed he had a bit too much respect for him. Like I said, whatever the result is, he's proved himself. Okay. Round number 15, the final round of this world title fight. Lester Ellis, the world IBF champion in the pink shorts against Barry Michael, the challenger. Lester had fought like a champion the entire way, and his last round was desperate. In between punches, Barry used every clinch to tie him up, making him fight just to free his arms. Just on a minute to go in the final round. Could it be the last minute of Lester Ellis's reign? Well, 
It could be. It certainly looks like it at this stage because Michael is the one that's putting all the pressure on. Approaching the end of the contest. Break, 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 the end of this IBF World Junior Lightweight title fight. There's the bell. It's all over. And very Michael. I must it's say, John, I have to applaud around. them both. I have to applaud them. Oh, you and everybody else in the stadium, Joe. A tremendous performance by both This will go down as one of the greatest fights in Australia. A tremendous contest between Barry Michael, the challenger, and Lester Ellis, the champion. And now it's up to the judges. To be honest, um, in my heart, I knew I was beaten. I wasn't beaten easy. I thought that could have been a draw, maybe, or any, but I knew I did think I was beaten. Keith thought I was a chance. Dana thought I was a chance. Everyone was... I don't know, it's up in the air either way, but in my heart, I knew I was beaten. Well, the, uh, the two boxers I'm glad now shaking back. hands and they're embracing, and that's good to see. And now it's up to the judges. And it's going to be very interesting indeed. Well, you thought uh, Barry Michael was... At the end of a fight that's that brutal and that hard, especially against a mate and someone that you, you know, sort of nurtured and trained and taught, um, you know, it was a warm embrace, and I, I was, I was, you know, proud of Lester. I was really proud of him the way he fought. And I said, even before the decision was announced, and I said, "You're a great fighter," and you know, thank, just thank you. You know, thanks for giving me the shot. Here's the judging. Judge John Wheeler gives it Ellis one four zero, Michael one four seven. That's He's two. It. He's won it. Barry That's Michael two of the judges. has won it. The I had a busted nose. I passed blood for the first time I'd ever, ever after, in my, you know, it was my 56th professional fight. But I was ecstatic. And my left ear was full of blood like you wouldn't believe it. You only had to touch it, it was very painful. But um, it was just, I always celebrated after a big victory. And we went out and had a big uh, function at a Chinese restaurant. And then I went home and I, I went to sleep and uh, I only slept for a few hours, woke up and realised I'd won the world title. It was like, it took a while to really sink in and then went out and started partying again. So, and did that for weeks, basically. It was just, uh, it was like the dream of a lifetime. And I, I did, I partied hard for a long time. What is very important for Lester to get into his mind now is that losing is not shameful. To lose is to make you that much better the next time. All the people that normally come running to the change room take me home, we're gonna have a party somewhere. I see nobody, I was only um, my dad. Keith and I, even my girlfriend shot through somewhere. So I, did, I, I learned from that fight, but I learned the hard way. I mean, I went home and I was hurting pretty bad, you know. To lose your world championship in front of your friends and your family can be a tremendous blow. Psychologically, you just got beat in front of everybody. In front of everybody, everybody, your mother, your father, your kids, your friends. Your girlfriends, your mistresses, they all saw you got beat in front of all these people. How in the hell are you supposed to feel? Until the day I die, I'm indebted to him for giving me the opportunity to fight for a world title that I'd been de denied uh, for a long, long time. And I thank, I thank Lester for that. Friends can be turned into enemies very easily. But after the fight, friendship is reborn. I wasn't. I'm upset with Barry anymore. I rang him up. I said, I want to take his breath out for dinner. I'll meet you at Williamstown Chinese shop. So I took some photos of him and I when I was 12 and I showed it to him. He had a tear in his eye, we shook hands, and after that, there was no more, no more trouble, no more bad mouth, and no more nothing. In 1987, Barry lost his title to Rocky Lockridge after three successful defences. Only months before the Lockridge fight, after a dispute over money in a Melbourne nightclub, Michael was badly beaten by Alphonse Scangitano and his men. I guess they felt as though that, you know, I'd taken away the goose that laid the golden egg. And the actual beating took a lot of desire away from me, it really did. And in the gym, every time I got hit on the nose, it hurt. And against Rocky Lockbridge, which was less than about four months later, when I lost the world title, it broke in the first round. So what they did to me in Lazar's, they, they certainly got me back, because that was the end of my career, really. I remember seeing the picture of Barry in the Herald Sun his bruised and battered face. And I looked at that, I thought, that's it. That's gotta be the last fight 
that he'll ever have, and it was. It was the last fight he ever had. Well, we all know that boxing is the uh, the least forgiving of all sports, and um, perversely, because it is the way it is, uh, it seems that every practitioner of it wants to somehow prove that wrong. Uh, they all have, as uh, someone once wrote, unfinished business. They lose and uh, they want to get back there at some point in their lives and show that uh, they didn't really deserve to lose, that they, they weren't losers, they were, they were winners. Uh, Lester retired probably three or four for, on five different occasions because of frustration and not being able to get anything. Like He, he was number one WBC uh, junior lightweight for a year. He was WBC uh, junior welterweight for a year. Like he went on and won another eight or ten titles after that. But I think the, the fight that he always wanted again was, was Barry. In 2002, Lester made an ill-considered comeback against Anthony Mundine and was stopped in three rounds. In the crowd, now approaching 50, was his old friend and rival, Barry Michael. After the fight, I went down to see Lester in the dressing room and I walked in, I said, are you all right, mate? He said, geez, he's big, isn't he, Baz? I said, I told you that, mate. He said, geez, he's fast, isn't he, Baz? I said, I told you that too, Lester. <laughs> and we had a hug and I said, mate, that's it. You know, no more, he said, no more. He would just turn up sometimes. And he turned up at my place one day, knocked on the door, had a couple of beers with him. He said, how are you, Baz? And we, we had a hug and I said, good, mate. He goes, have you got that fight? I said, what, which fight? He goes, you and I. I said, I think so, yeah, come in. So I put the tape on and we sat down and watched each other fighting each other and commentated through it, you know, and he's gone, too strong, Baz, too strong. Hurt you there though, didn't I? Remember all the stuff we were saying to each other? Yeah. Yeah? I do the only bloke that can talk for 15 rounds. <laughs> Smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not bad, man. Yeah. I talked all of them, I just... Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you hit me hard. It was, you know, like, I mean, it was one of the best right hands I'd ever taken. <laughs> 